Hey guys, my name is Atif Shanawaz. I'm an internal medicine doctor and I make videos explaining medical topics in layman's terms. In this video, you'll learn the different ways that a heart attack might manifest itself. And I think just as importantly, you'll learn how we physicians think through these symptoms and assess the likelihood that such symptoms might be caused by heart disease. If you'd like to see more content from this channel, please go ahead and subscribe and click on that bell notification icon as well so you don't miss out on any new videos as they come out. Now, before we get much further, I wanna clarify something up front here, and that is this. What is the difference between angina and a heart attack? Angina is basically a syndrome of chest pain. When we use the word angina, we're basically talking about chest pain. If there is no chest pain, it's not angina. But can you have a heart attack without angina? Absolutely you can, and I will talk about how we approach patients who might be having a heart attack without angina symptoms. But understand this, that when angina is part of the clinical picture, then a heart attack is basically the symptoms of angina except highly magnified. Meaning that from a clinical perspective, a heart attack is basically a very bad case of angina. So it's useful to talk about what angina is because if the symptoms of angina are really severe and they don't go away, it's likely that in that case, what we're talking about is really a heart attack. So with that distinction out of the way, let's get started. There is a well-recognized syndrome of chest pain that raises the possibility that a heart attack might be occurring, or it may be around the corner, like it's on the horizon. This syndrome is called typical angina, and it goes like this. The patient describes a severe, troubling chest pain that is what we call substernal, meaning that it feels like the pain is coming from underneath the sternum. The quality of this pain can manifest in a variety of ways. Some patients describe it as a sharp, severe pain. Others use the word crushing chest pain as if there was a great heaviness on their chest. They sometimes say that it feels like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. And this pain might not be localized to the chest though. It can radiate mostly to the left side of the chest, all the way up into the arm, upwards into the jaw and the neck. And in typical angina, there are other symptoms that are not pain related. Shortness of breath is a really common one. The patient's oxygen levels would be perfectly fine, but they'll feel short of breath anyway. In addition, they might also start sweating profusely, like sweat is just pouring down their face even though the space that they're in might be cold. It has nothing to do with the temperature of the room or the temperature of the patient themselves. This symptom, by the way, is known as diaphoresis, which basically just means being really sweaty. The fourth symptom is nausea, and that itself might be so severe that the patient actually vomits. Now, the symptoms of angina usually occurs when the patient is engaged in some physical activity like walking, running, or climbing upstairs. Now, when it's just angina and not a heart attack, the symptoms usually go away with rest. Patients will say that the symptoms come and go, but it may just last a few minutes, but usually not longer than 20 or 30 minutes if it's just angina. The longer the symptoms last, the more likely it is that we're dealing with a true blue heart attack and not mere angina. A fifth element to the syndrome is what happens when the patient receives a drug called nitroglycerin. This is a small pill or a spray that is administered under the tongue and it rapidly gets absorbed by the body and causes the coronary arteries of the heart to open up, relieving the angina symptoms. When we encounter a patient with chest pain that is relieved by nitroglycerin, it is highly suspicious for heart disease. Now, after having described these symptoms, let me tell you that this so-called typical angina is actually not that typical. Besides the chest pain, most patients I've seen usually have just a couple of the other things I've described. Maybe they have the nausea, but not the shortness of breath. Maybe they'll have the shortness of breath, but they won't be sweating at all. It's the rare patient that presents the emergency room with all five of these elements in the angina or the heart attack spectrum. Now the diagnosis is a simple matter if the patient has all of these symptoms, but that's usually never the case. And the way that we clinicians think about this is that the more of the elements the patient has, the higher the probability of heart disease becomes. And besides the variance in the number of symptoms that I've just described, there's also great variance in the nature of the chest pain itself. The substernal crushing chest pain that radiates to the left side of the body is a classic description of heart attack related pain. But again, this can vary. It may present as more of a comfort, not an actual pain. Sometimes it's even a little bit difficult to characterize properly and the patient will just say that they feel vaguely uneasy around the chest. Other descriptions are a sense of a band wrapping its way around the chest or a sensation of a knot in the middle of the chest. It may not even radiate at all. Or if it does radiate, it will radiate to the right or maybe towards the back. So these are all the ways the symptom of a heart attack can depart from the standard model of typical angina. 
And one of the other things that we typically ask patients with chest pain symptoms is how the pain changes when they're taking a deep breath in. Pain that worsens considerably when they're taking a deep breath in is called pleuritic chest pain. And generally speaking, that is not caused by the heart, but it's usually caused by the lungs. We also ask if the part of the chest where the pain is located is tender. If we press on a patient's chest and it is tender there, that too is usually not associated with angina. So pleuritic chest pain and chest pain that is tender generally move us away from a diagnosis of angina and heart attack. Now, to further complicate things, there's also something called atypical angina where there is no chest pain at all but the patient is having symptoms related to heart disease. And you already know what some of these are. The shortness of breath, the nausea, the profuse sweating that I just described, but the patient might also have some really vague symptoms as well, such as symptoms of indigestion, as if they ate something that didn't agree with them, or they might be having a sensation of a heart beating irregularly, or they may pass out, or they may just feel tired. So really vague symptoms sometimes. And these symptoms are also sometimes referred to as anginal equivalents. Now, how do we know if symptoms like say shortness of breath or indigestion or nausea or fatigue are an anginal equivalent or not? The short answer is that we don't know. It's only when and if the patient presents to the physician and a test is done that confirms the angina or the heart attack that we know. In other words, when it comes to these symptoms that we call anginal equivalents, it's only retrospectively that we realize that the symptoms were caused by a heart attack. Typically, patients with heart disease that don't manifest as angina, but rather as anginal equivalents, those tend to be older. They tend to be diabetics, and they also tend to be women. Now, I hope by now you're getting a sense of the wide spectrum of symptoms that a heart attack can present with. And as you can see, it's not always that straightforward, and sometimes we clinicians need to tease these symptoms apart and make judgment calls on whether or not particular symptoms mandate a workup for a heart attack. So let's get into how we physicians think this through. A critical element of our decision-making process is assessing the patient's risk factors for having heart disease in the first place, and then considering that assessment with the symptoms that have been presented to us. In other words, these symptoms cannot be considered in a vacuum. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. Say we have a healthy 21-year-old female. She runs five miles a day. She's also on her school swim team and recently won the national championships. She eats a healthy diet, never touched a cigarette in her life, has never done drugs. She has 14% body fat and her grandparents and her mother and father, they're all healthy, they don't have any signs of heart disease, they don't take any medications at all. Now imagine this patient starts having chest pain that radiates to the jaw that is substernal with shortness of breath and nausea. What are the odds that these symptoms in this patient represents heart disease? As classic as these symptoms are, the chances are still low. Now in this patient, I would still do an EKG, a 12 lead EKG, I would still do some blood work, but if those came back normal, I would immediately start looking for other things that would cause similar symptoms. Anxiety, for example, especially panic attacks, can closely mimic angina symptoms. Now other tests that we might consider is doing a CAT scan of the chest in this particular case to make sure that it isn't a problem with an aneurysm or a blood clot in the lung. Now consider patient number two. You have here a morbidly obese 70-year-old male who has a history of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day for 55 years. The guy does cocaine on a regular basis. He has poorly controlled diabetes, never takes his blood pressure medication, and his mother, father, brother, and sister, hell, even his dog died of a heart attack. Now, what are the chances that this patient has heart disease to begin with? I would say they're pretty high, right? Now, suppose this patient, this particular patient came in having a feeling of really bad indigestion or had some shortness of breath as well. Throw in some intermittent nausea symptoms and nothing else, no chest pain. Now, how should such symptoms be interpreted? When in such a patient, these symptoms, subtle though they are, should mandate a consideration for heart disease. This patient might be having angina. In fact, this patient might very well be having a heart attack. And this is what I mean when I say that these symptoms can't be considered in a vacuum. The kind of patient who's having them have to be kept in mind because that has real significance in their interpretation. Now, while I describe these two examples to illustrate a point, the majority of the patients with symptoms suggestive of angina or heart attack, obviously, they fall somewhere into the middle of these two extremes. And in those cases, the interpretation of symptoms, to some extent, is really just a judgment call on the part of the clinician, and it's where the clinician's experience and thoughtfulness is brought to bear 
in the case in front of them. Hey, listen, if you found this helpful to you, please do me a favor and click on that like button. Consider subscribing if you haven't subscribed already. And if you have any comments or follow up questions on anything I've discussed here, please feel free to put them down in the comment section and I will get back to you. Also, if you have any topic that you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comment section as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.